his way of doing things. That's why we need to know what God says it takes to be a healthy, born-again believer so that you can be a healthy church collectively. It says that there is one baptism. Now, uh, you know, if you've been in the religious circle any amount of time, they teach several baptisms. God wants you to know they want. But once again, when God puts something out there, the human nature, because it loves the spectacular, it loves sensationalism, it is always trying to find something out uh, that it can uh, focus on to create the sensational. People will tell you, if you don't have this baptism, if you don't have that baptism, uh, you're not complete. Well, all of that is a lie from the enemy because it's man-made for his religious practices that's going to elevate him in his mind over others. Religion is always looking for the sensational. That's going to make you feel good, make you feel like you have something that you don't. And when you get to seasons like we had in 2020, we find that none of that can help you when the enemy is allowed to attack you. That's the whole point of being a child of God, is being king's children, where you rule because you have authority over every name that can be named. So he says there's one baptism. And water baptism is an essential part of the church culture. We're supposed to be building a culture that represents the kingdom of heaven. And like with any culture, the way you continue your culture to go on, you establish things that you do that represent who you are. But it's for a purpose. It has a meaning that identifies you. So he says there's one baptism, and it is an act of obedience to Jesus Christ, our Lord. This baptism is an act of obedience to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the Bible, God's Word, commands every born-again believer to be baptized. But man, in his own infinite wisdom, he has a way of tweaking everything that God sends his way. So you have different types of baptism, but God wants you to know today there's only one that he recognizes and only one that he's called you to teach. In this understanding, we understand that water baptism is symbolic. It's symbolic. It won't do nothing else for you. It is symbolic of washing away sin. Now, please understand that baptism by water doesn't save you. It don't save you. If it don't save you, it can't unsave you. Hear what I just said? If it can't save you, it can't unsave you. It's something that God has given us to do, and it's symbolic. Because no amount of water will wash away your sins. No amount of water will wash away your sins. See, and this symbolism of baptism is that Jesus, just as Christ died and was buried. So the baptized person is submerged. He's put under the water. He's completely covered. That is baptism. That's what baptism means. It means to submerge, to put under. God says the baptism that I recognize and have called you to teach means that the person is put underneath the water. Because it's symbolic. He's trying, it's a word picture. No, it's a picture physically of what has happened already spiritually. It has a meaning. That's why we learn to talk with purpose. Talk with me. Don't just talk for the sake of hearing yourself talk. So when you talk, you have to always ask yourself, why am I going to talk to so-and-so today? What's the outcome I'm looking for? I'm going to call so-and-so. What is the outcome that I'm looking for on this call? Because if you understand what you're looking for, you know what kind of conversations you need to be having. Because if you go into any of those conversations without no purpose, you will be all over the place and you won't accomplish nothing but wasting time. We are supposed to be about purpose. We are always at work in our father's business. We are always representing our father. 
And that's what baptism does. It is a way of representing your agreement to obey our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when going down in the water represents being baptized, dying to your sinful nature, rising from the grave shows that you're coming up in a new life. It's just unfortunate because of religion. Some people go down a dry devil and come up a wet devil because they don't understand why they're doing what they're doing. It's just some ritual that is required at a certain age. And we just go through the motions and we assume that just because we've been baptized, we are saved. That's a lie from the devil. Because you get saved before you get baptized. And you need to understand what getting baptized and being saved represents, which requires you to be teaching your people, your children from birth of what the objectives are, what the goals are, and why they are important. See, water baptism is one of the first opportunities that a follower of Jesus Christ has to show that she, he or she is not ashamed to be associated with Jesus Christ as the Lord of their life. And the word Lord means boss. It means master. Not your sidekick. Not your road partner. Your boss that has left you clear instructions on what he expects from you. Which is why we do or what we do based on what his word says. See, it is the outward act that symbolizes the inward phenomena of what has happened on the inside. Coming to and accepting Jesus Christ as real. He's not like Santa Claus. You have realized that Jesus Christ is a living entity, a living being, and you recognize what he has done for you. And in recognizing that, you agree to go into covenant with him. And in going into covenant with him, you make an agreement to let him be your Lord. To let him be the guide of your life. You see, the sacrifice means that those who believe in him can be forever reconciled to God. The purpose of baptism is to give visual testimony of our commitment to Christ. It is the first step to discipleship, which you see in Acts 8, 26 through 39. So what about baptism? Acts 8, 26 through 39. You can read it uh, when you have the chance. And as I said earlier, baptism means to submerge, to be fully wet. Not sprinkled. Not tapped on the forehead with a couple of dots of water. It means to go underneath the water completely and to be risen from that. Because it's symbolic of what you are connecting yourself to. So when we talk about one baptism, what he is saying is this. Water baptism is an act of faith and obedience to the command of God. Water baptism is an act of faith and obedience to the commands of Christ and is the only one in which the believer must obey and teach. Water baptism acknowledged as symbolic of what has already happened spiritually is the only baptism that God requires us to obey and teach. If anyone is teaching a baptism outside of water submersion, uh, they are doing something that is a distraction from what God has called us to do. And it will become the thing that is most focused on because these other water bap these other baptisms are trying to make you prove something. This baptism is not trying to prove anything. It's just showing what you agree with. Anything that is done to make you believe or make you prove 
or who you are is not from God. Because this walk we are becoming, we are constantly becoming more and more like Jesus each day. Not more talented in our singing. Not more uh, entertaining in our preaching. See, if you don't understand the word of God, you, you don't understand that I'm preaching right now. See, because religion says, I got to be, well, now saints, let me tell you about this baptism, a baptism that God has called us all to walk into. Let me tell you something. If you can go down in the water and rise up in a new life in Christ, life is going to be all right. Yeah, that I can't do it, it just ain't necessary. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Because I can get better at it just like they have. They practice. Just like with anything, if you practice it long enough, you would get better at it. But I want to practice what's going to be most effective. Because <laughs> I don't want you talking to me now. <laughs> Pastor was getting down the day woman. I don't want you to leave here saying that. I don't want you to say, man, pastor was really had the spirit of the day. I don't want you leaving here saying that. I want you leaving here saying that word that pastor taught today was clear. Yeah. It showed me all my stuff that I need to be delivered from because I went down in baptism. And I learned today that my rising from the water ain't lining up when it was supposed to be looking like. That's what God has called us to do. Are you hearing me? But religion says, oh, you got to get a hum in there. Yeah. <laughs> God is calling on to right now. Amen. Thank you, God. Yeah. Come on in with me now. Can you hear me, saints? Can I get an amen out there right now? Ain't God good all the time and all the time that God is good? Yay! Yes, Lord. I want you to say, this is what I want you to know, it ain't never been a problem with God. It ain't never been a question whether God was good or not. This book ain't written to, for God to get good. <laughs> This book is written so you can get good. Amen. So you can look like that God that's good all the time. Amen. That's what we call to do. And you don't need to be confused when you leave here. I don't want you to get caught up on my hoop and forget that word I said. I don't want you leaving here talking about, man, that was a good service today. What did he talk about? Uh... Uh, I don't know, but it was good. Because the Spirit was high. The Holy Spirit just had me all over the place. I ain't hear nothing. That ain't from God. That's the messages I've been getting from religious folks. I want to have a pastor. I've been teaching these stiff necked hard-headed people for 20 years, and they ain't changed since the first day I started. Well, all the thing he don't realize, he's talking about his inability to do what God has called him to do because he spent too much time in religion trying to satisfy something that ain't going to never obey God. Mm -hmm. That's that human nature. So it's only one baptism you need to be concerned about. When you go down in the water and come up, and not just going down and coming up, you need to understand how it impacts you. Is there really a new creation or just a wet devil? Therefore, go and make the this is what the scripture says. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So it's a commandment from God. But he has it a certain way, and Jesus is our example. When he got baptized, he said he went under the water. And when he came up, he saw heaven open. And the dove came down and rested on him. To fill him with the power that he needed, he would need to go do the work that he's been prepared to do. That's what baptism represents. Coming up not just 
in a new relationship, but with power and authority. So, baptism is a public statement, declares that you are followers of Jesus Christ. It is a move from death to life. It is a move from death to life. So you have to ask yourself, what is it really all about then? If you've been raised with Christ and you've been baptized into Christ, what is it all about? I'm glad you asked. So you won't leave here thinking I'm just trying to rock the boot because I got some kind of issue. My God tells me in Romans chapter 6, because we need to understand this baptism. And meanwhile, when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or people are talking about giving their life to the Lord, this way you need to take them so they understand what's going to be required. Are you hearing me? It says, Romans chapter 6, starting at verse 1, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who have died to sin still live in it? But do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus and have been baptized into his death, therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For we have become united with him in the likeness of his death. Certainly, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with. So that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, even so, even so. Consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's what the baptism represents. Now, the coming up from the grave represents this. Therefore, now that you've been baptized, given your life to the Lord, and you are a new creature, therefore, do not let sin reign in your body immortal any longer. Yay! So that you obey its lust. My God, we need to hear that again. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Can I get an amen? If you love that verse right there. Yeah. All right, then. I didn't get an amen so they don't love that one. But that's all right. God loves it. And because God loves it, I love it, saints. But he ain't finished with you yet. Oh, have mercy. Because you've been raised in baptism. Man. So that you obey his lust and do not go on and do not go on and do not go on. You, you do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. Yeah, do you hear what the word said, saints? It said that Jesus ain't going to do this for you. Yeah. It said that you ain't got nothing to do. You ain't got there yet. Yeah, get a, get a amen again. All right then. Yes. You, you that's been baptized, have been raised into a new life, you who profess to be that person, you no longer allow, present your body your, as instruments to see. You. You, not me, not the pastor, not Jesus, not God, not the Holy Spirit, but you, you who profess to be awesomely, wonderfully, and fearlessly made, who is afraid of you? You don't present no longer your 
members as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as, as those alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. This is what you tell people when they say they want to give their life to God. This is what's going to be required of you. You ain't going to wake up one day and you just magically change. Because he says that for those who are dead, he says, Present yourself to God as those alive from the dead. What that look like? Read Romans 12, chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. That I beseech you, brothers, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies to God every day as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Which is the least you can do, because you've been baptized. You accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's the least you expect of you, right? This is not something special. This is the elementary part. Mm -hmm. This is grammar school. This is your ABCs. This is where you start off at. Some people think this is a this is a years of philosophical knowledge and growing that you've grown to a place. No, you came to this place when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace, which some people believe because of religion? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience? You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. That's my story. That's God's story. Because you've been baptized. Which you say, yeah, I've been baptized. So do you look like you came up or are you still under the water? Because there's a saying in the world, you go to sleep on your job. As long as you sleep, you've got a job. But when you wake up, you fine. Amen. So some people might into suspended animation still under the water. Yeah. And haven't come up yet Amen. to realize that they have been delivered from their old nature. Mm -hmm. What is the verdict? You, you, you. And you always talk about you and what you want. You do this. Because that's what you said you had committed to. Then he goes on to say, there is one God and Father. One God and Father. One God, one Father. Now, uh, as I hear that word, those words, as I look across the religious community, there are a lot of fathers in Christ. I'm your Father in Christ. I birthed you into the ministry. Lord, have mercy. Jesus Christ, help us, help us. And there are so many people out here walking around talking about some man is their father because he may have taught them the word of God. But that's religion because man is always, always trying to elevate himself or someone else. God says there's one God and one father. I am not your father in the ministry. I'm your pastor. And I'm your brother in Christ. That should be sufficient. Are you hearing me? But see, well, you don't understand that you are kind of sensitive about kindness. How people address you. What you want me to call you, Pastor? Uh, well, my name is Curtis. You know what? That's when you and God. Look, I'm good with Curtis. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing me? Some people you call my name. Uh, excuse me, that's... Uh, that's, that's doctor, philosopher, bishop, pastor, <laughs> man of God, yeah. awesome one. Yeah. Taylor. 
And they're highly offended. Yeah. <laughs> if you do not go through that process with them. Yeah. I'm sorry, it's just too long for me. <laughs> I just say hey when I see you. But that's what religion does. It takes the things of God and tries to pull it out. So that they can find something to elevate itself on. You got one God and one Father. There are no false gods. There is only one God. There's only one God. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says, Yet for us, those who have been born again and have been baptized, there is but one God, the Father from whom all things came, and for whom we exist. We exist to please our God and God because we understand the meaning of each title. Those titles hold something dear or dear meaning to us. And when we use them, we have a clear understanding of what we're saying. One God, one Father. Galatians 4 4 through 7. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law, so that we could adopt, so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. Prompting us to call out our Father. Now, uh, you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. One God, one Father. God is our God because he is the God of creation. He's our Father because he sent his son, Jesus, to redeem us so that we could be called and adopted as his brother. Are you hearing me? There's one God, there's one Father. No one can be your spiritual father. If you're calling someone your spiritual father, you have just stepped over in religion and you are now outside of the principles of God which is where Satan wants you to be. Mm -hmm. That's why God didn't give us a lot of physical things to do. He gave you physical things to do that you can't mess them up if you're doing the one he told you to do. Are you hearing that? <laughs> but to understand the concept of one God and one Father, we need to understand the sovereignty and divine providence of God. To understand God the Father, you need to understand the sovereignty of God and the divine providence of God. We already know that God's sovereignty means that God rules over all creation. Nothing happens unless God calls it to happen or allows it to happen. That's the sovereignty of God who cannot be questioned because you don't have enough faculty to question God. So when you question the things that are going on in the world, you are actually questioning the sovereignty of God. You're questioning whether he does he know what he's doing because this should not be happening if he's your God. And you understand who he is. See, understanding God's sovereignty is the only way to make sense of and cope with the unexpected pain, problems, confusion, and tragedies of life. Once you come to understand and know the sovereignty of God, you understand the way of God. And when you see people living lifestyles, that don't line up with the word of God. Not that you have to speculate. God has left clear instructions on what your life will look like if you're not obeying him, right? 
So if you see people not obeying God's word, and you see the very prediction that he made how their life will look if they're not obeying the word of God, what are you supposed to say? Wow, that confirms God's word. He said if you don't obey him, your life will look like this. So if you adventure God forbid to die, you have a clear understanding of what led to the problem based on what the word says. I can't be selling drugs every day, trying to have my way, cursing people out, doing my thing, ruining the community and everybody's lives. You can't expect me to, you can't say if I die, I'm going to heaven, but everybody gets wings now today. Yeah, yes indeed. You know they've brought no good to society. They've brought no good to life. They've caused nothing but problems and suffering and pains for the people that were involved with them. But yet because of religion, you say when they die, they got their wings today and they went to heaven. It's not for me to speculate whether they did or not. What it does, it tells me how I should view what happened because of the word of God. I won't bring no final judgment, but I'll say their word, their life was a testament to the very word of God. When I see people being righteous, obeying God, and following his instructions, and I see that they're having the quality of life that God promises, they're being of value to the people in their world and their community and bringing value and bringing a pleasant environment, what am I supposed to say? Their life is a testament to the word of God and the sovereignty of God and how he allows everything to happen, things that he agree with and things that he don't agree with so he can bring about his will anyway. Isn't that so? God allows things that he agree with to happen. He allows things that he don't agree with to happen. But in the, in the end of the story, it all brings about his will. Don't you think you would keep living any kind of way and they don't have to pay no, no price? It'll shorten your days. But what does religion say? They were good people. They meant what? Well, what good did they do? The sovereignty of God has a standard that he will not lower for you, for me, or no one else. See, understanding God's sovereignty rules out the belief, belief in faith. Coincidence. Luck. Or happenstance. Nothing just happens. And what does religion in the world tell you? Stuff happens. You can't believe in God if that's your perception of life. Everything happens for a reason. And God allows it to happen. All you got to do is line the word of God with what you see happening and see what the word says about it. But we ain't talking about the word of God. We want to know what you think. You don't want to know what I think. Because if you ask me what I think, I think they ended up in hell. Mm -hmm. Well, I believe and know that they are with the Lord. So you don't know, want to know what I think. Because I would not dare speculate. What I will do is continue to observe those that call on the name of the Lord and observe their walk according to the word of God and just see how things are turning out. As we read Deuteronomy uh, 28 verses 1 through 14. But man, you go down from 15 to the end of chapter, that's a long, long journey. And when I read that part, a lot, I see a lot of faces. I see a lot of faces when I read Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 20, 15 down to the end of the chapter. I think it's about 60 some verses. When I read those verses and I look across the landscape, and I look across social media, and I hear of the things that people are experiencing, 
and I look at their lives compared to the Word of God, hey man, your life's just producing what the Word said it would produce. But people want to look at all the blessings God promised. They want to try to measure their life by that. 99.9% need to read verses 15 to 60 something. <laughs> you will see yourself there, I guarantee you. <laughs> if you are not pursuing righteousness, I guarantee and I dare anybody to hear me. Go read Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 to the end of the chapter. I guarantee you'll find yourself in there. And I don't even know who you are. Because no. <laughs> God is God. He created this world. He has already predicted how it's going to turn out for everybody. You either will find yourself between 1 and 14 or 15 and 60 beyond. I guarantee you, really, don't find yourself. And don't lie. Don't lie. Don't lie. Tell the truth. So God will love you. Tell the truth. That's a start. Guarantee you. Don't keep listening to this foolish religion. Go into the word for yourself. And let the Holy Spirit teach you what thus says the Lord. If you want to have a life that glorifies God. Therefore, to understand all that goes on in life, you must understand the sovereignty of God. God never wants your circumstances to override his promises or his <coughs> presence. You know, I, 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 I've forgotten that in November, uh, God was leading me to teach you that uh, sometimes, somewhere in your faith, you're going to have to face death. I forgot that. I really had to someone remind me. And lo and behold, <laughs> you tried not to answer. <laughs> Boom! Let me in. I have permission. Yes. I have been given permission by the Son of God to shake your world up this month. Because I told him, you ain't got that kind of faith. I told him you would run to the hills and hide. <laughs> and I've been given permission to come in here, but he told me I can't kill you. Because <laughs> I know they phony. They don't care nothing about no sovereign God, nor no divine providence of God. <coughs> They only want what they want, and they want it like they want it when they want it. That's what they are. Mm. Oh, but God. Yes. It didn't matter where you were found. Mm -hmm. You act like Job. <laughs> Naked I came. Naked I leave. Amen. If dying is what I must do, Amen. dying is what I'm going to do, because I'm going to stand on what I believe. Yes. It doesn't matter how I got here. Yes. But one thing I do know for sure, I got faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He kicked and he scratched and he clawed. Mm -hmm. He hollered. He said, well now, ain't you tired, brother? Mm -hmm. All you got to do is roll up to uh, uh, that place that they say they can help you now. Yay. <laughs> you could probably get some relief today. Come on now. Oh, maybe right even right now. All you got to do is ring the bell. Woo! Say, Lord, I'm tired. I don't want to operate on that level. I've gone down with the foot soldiers, Lord, but I need some relief now. I know you told me that if I just wait on you, it's going to be better in the morning. But, Lord, I don't think I got another uh, <laughs> second of energy left. <laughs> well, my mind is Come telling on, me man. all sorts of things, Lord. <laughs> Lord, and it's, and it's making real good sense to my mind right now. Lord, because I know this ain't nothing to be playing with. I'll play with lying. I'll play with stealing. But, Lord, I don't want to be playing with death. Do you understand All right, man. Lord, I, 
my mind is saying, just live today and get it right tomorrow. But Lord, 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 I come too far now. I'm going to stand on it even if it kills me. Yes. I'm going to stand on it if, even if they tell me I'm a fake. Yeah. Okay. Lord, I'm going to stand because I know if I stand, mm -hmm. it's going to be a lot better after I go through this. Yes. Because yes. I know in here, Lord, you're in here somewhere. I can't see you right now. <laughs> Lord, I'm having questions to know whether I even know you or not. Come on, but Lord, I was told if I just stand a little while longer. Yes. I'm down, Lord. I'm going down. I'm going down. <laughs> Holy Spirit, help me. Pick me up, Lord. And he started to pick me up. Oh, I felt like dying. I talked about dying. I just knew I was dying. But God said he promised me good health and long life. All right. And it don't look like it now, Lord. But we got time. I think I want to wait on you. I think I'm going to continue to call on you. Because you do not lie. Lord have mercy. Ain't you glad about the saints? Yes. All right, yes. It don't come to do it. No. What did David say? I ain't gonna offer you nothing I ain't paid for. <laughs> I'm gonna give you the best I have. And all you got is faith. Yes. Are you hearing me? Yes. That's when you've been baptized <laughs> and been given the Holy Spirit. You have faith in your God. Mm -hmm. You have faith in his word. And when you get down on your dying bird bed, his word just come to pass, don't it? Yes. It's something about making that decision to die that changes things, ain't it? Mm -hmm. Once you make the decision to die, it looks like you get new life. Yes. <laughs> All of a sudden, I feel better. Because he had to loosen his grip on you. Yeah, he was trying to tell you, curse God and die. He lied to you. He said you shouldn't pull the house stuff like this. He said you would speak it off and you would speak it like crazy. There ain't nothing going nowhere. Looks like every time you speak it gets worse. Worse. Amen. Yeah. He believed that if he was allowed to let you suffer like that, you don't deny your God. Except what he was offering you. Lord, 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 if you just don't know the danger you were in. Yeah. If I could just get you to accept my way. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. I go about my business. Because I got you now. Your confession, your testimony, didn't line up with what you say you believe. That's the God we serve. See, when you go through things like this, your view of God becomes larger than your circumstances. Mm -hmm. Even if it doesn't make sense to your mind. Mm -hmm. Even if it don't feel good to your body. So that's why it would be best to continue to program your mind in the word of God. Not foolish religious sins. Mm -hmm. Something that's going to give you power. So when death come knocking, you know that I don't care how he flip me, how he treat me. I know it just means one thing. Boy, at the end of this, this job. Yes. At the end of this job right here, man, this is a good paying job right here. All right. This is one of them jobs where you ride out of town and they pay you $500 an hour with room and board and food and a stipend to take care of yourself yeah. like that. And free transportation. Yeah. Those are the type of jobs people leave their home for months for. Yeah. Are you hearing me? God said, look, I got a job for y'all. I, 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 I want you to get rich. I want you to be able to purchase anything that you desire. But I need you to put it in your faith account. Ain't no need to handle no money. Don't spend money on this one thinking that you're going to be in a better shape. Are you hearing me? Just go through it and buy it with faith. Yes. Buy it with faith. At the end of the job, when I make that transfer, and you're looking to your mind about where y'all was going, you'll see that I can do everything because I got plenty of faith to purchase. Ain't nothing impossible for me. Yes. Because of going through the job. Because if it was a dangerous job, <laughs> it's a life threatening job. Yes. Amen. And once. Bad move is death. Yeah. Everybody 
don't take them jobs. He said, no, I don't want it that much to be messing with that kind of electricity. <laughs> but there are a chosen few because of practicing the word of righteousness will be like Job. He said, Job didn't accuse God of nothing. That means he didn't ask why. Mm -mm. God give it. God take it away. Mm -hmm. I was enjoying the good health and the prosperity. I got to enjoy the pain and suffering that he has found necessary mm -hmm. for me to experience through this time. Mm -hmm. Well, he warned me. <laughs> I can't be shocked. He just told me a week or two ago, but he, it's too fast. I didn't get prepared. Yeah. Yeah. But God don't do nothing yeah. if you haven't already been prepared for it. Mm -hmm. Lord have mercy. Then it comes to understanding that your outlook for tomorrow winds up with what God promised. Only then will God <coughs> manifest what he promised before the situation. Therefore, you must keep your eyes on Jesus in your mind on God's word and promise. Mm -hmm. See, the enemy came to try. He wants it all. He wants it all just like God. He wants it all. Yeah, that's it. Because if you don't understand what God is doing, <laughs> after he don't attack your health, yeah. he might try to mess with your finances. Finance, and you might have made some decisions. And, and if you're looking at what the enemy trying to do, you be like, oh, my God. It was way up there, and that was way down here. Mm -hmm. I got excited. Oh, I can get me more now, and, and you know I can get less money and get more. It's just I, I, God knew I want. I said, God, man, if it was only cheap, <laughs> it was only cheap. That hundred dollars a month would look a lot better. That thousand dollars would look a lot better. Lo and behold, it got cheaper. Some folks got scared. I said, look, I am not concerned about what the enemy doing. Mm -hmm. My dad is just good to me like that. He knew I wanted to get more and get it cheap. Yeah. And what did he do? Yeah. Just like that. Mm -hmm. Now, what am I supposed to do? Amen. When I see the very word and will of my sovereign God come to pass. That has promised to give me the desires of my heart. See, if you're not looking at it from what God is doing, mm -hmm. the enemy will make you think he's in charge. Mm -hmm. He ain't in charge of nothing. He definitely in charge of me. Because look, I don't know how much more I need him. But I'm in a lot better place now where I don't need him coming as often as he thinks he needs to come. That's what I do. <laughs> That's what I like to be. Because I'm learning how to make things, a lot of things, unnecessary. It ain't necessary. It ain't necessary. Because I see you in everything. I see you how you I'm looking at that fly right there. Why are you in it? Hey. God allowed that fly to be in it. That's his creation too. Yeah. Now, what does your response to God's creation yeah. say about you? Oh, you, you don't want to share everything with all this creation. You feel you got some special space that only you should occupy. Maybe I should send the whole crew down. No, you don't need to send the whole crew. Shh, go on about your business so you can live. <laughs> Shoot, I need time to reevaluate. Yes. To recognize what's going on. Amen. So I don't interject into God's plan because of my desire. Yeah. Are you hearing me? Some people look at you like flies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Be careful of the standard that you have. Yeah. Because you will have to walk that standard yourself. Are you hearing me? So then you need to understand the divine providence. God runs the universe and your life through divine providence. Divine providence is the method God uses to rule creation that brings together the different events and circumstances to honor the free will of man. Yes. In divine providence, God works behind the scenes, in allowing for and incorporating human freedom to choose. 
in Isaiah 45, 15. He's behind the scenes. And if you don't understand the fine providence of God, you will think it's people, circumstances, and situations that's making things happen. Mm -hmm. God uses everything Amen. to Amen. bring about his will. Yeah. And that you need to understand yeah. if you want to operate in the fullness of being a child of God. Because if you don't understand it, you'll find yourself talking about the very work of God. Yeah. Therefore, we must learn to work with divine providence because we understand that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love him yeah. and have been called according to his purpose. Mm -hmm. So he's doing and using everything to transform you into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. our brother. That's what it's all about. Amen. Will this situation reveal that you look like Jesus or you look like you don't know him? Or you one of those that put your stuff on the shelf when it's needed, you know? I think I put my religion, which is what it is, religion on the shelf, because you can't put this on the shelf if you got it. Amen. For God said to Moses, I will show mercy to anyone I choose. And I will show compassion to anyone I choose. So it is God who decides to show mercy. He can neither choose it nor work for it. Ain't it strange that those of us that say we love God have a problem with some people that God shows mercy to? Because some people in their thinking will think like, you know, when we go through all this stuff we're going through, why not get rid of the people that started and caused it? Problem completely off the table. Put fear in the hearts of others who thought that this was even possible. And you haven't changed your heart. Son, it takes time for everyone. Sometimes the worst struggle you can have is being alive to watch the mess you've made yeah. and the lives you've ruined. Mm -hmm. We just don't know what it takes for each of us. Some would want to die, go and get up. No, you're going to live. Think about this. You see, for the scriptures say that God told Pharaoh, I have appointed you for the very purpose of displaying my power in you and to spend, spread my fame throughout the earth. So you see, God chooses to show mercy to whom he wishes. And he chooses to harden the hearts of others so they refuse to listen. That means you cannot look at your life circumstances first as the reference point of life. You can't look at what's happening to you as the reference point. You have to understand the divine problems of how God works. And how is he working in this to transform me into the image of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Just look at how you respond and ask yourself, is how I'm responding lining up with the character of Jesus? And if it's not, now you know why you're going through what you're going through. If you say you love the Lord. When God allows people to do things to those committed to him, he allows it for good reason. There, you must not see, seek to come out of the situation. You must remain in it to see what God is trying to teach you and reveal about you, but also so you can meet him there. So that you will know for a fact that God can bring you through these things, but also make you better off on the outside when you come out of it than you were when you went in it. See, God has designed your life to humble you and test you to prove your character mm -hmm. and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. God humbles you by letting you go hungry to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Mm -hmm. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Because we understand God's divine promise that he is our father. In our struggles against sin, we don't forget God, our Father's words of encouragement. He encourages when you're going through. Yes, I know you're, you're, you're going through hard times now. 
Because he addresses us as a father does his sons. The father says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chases everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as a disciple. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? This generation. If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who discipline us, and we re and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of Spirits and live? They discipline us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may be disabled, so the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Because God is God and your Father, and nothing happens without His permission, you understand all that is happening is for your good. That's God the Father. He's our God and He's our Father. And He's in charge of everything. Everything. Nothing happens in creation without God's permission. So the question what's going on is to question God. But not only that, you are talking about your poor management skills because God has given all of this created thing to you. You're supposed to be managing it. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be bringing it into the order of God. <clears throat> and to complain about it is to complain about your poor management skills saying that you are not able to handle what God has given you. That's what I want to leave you with today. These are things that God has given us that we need to focus on if we want to, number one, prevent from being distracted by the enemy, know what we need to be focused on that's going to bring spiritual health and development to our lives individually and collectively as a church.